How's it going, my dudes? This video is brought to you by Squarespace today. In our first video outlining the alien races who brought the universe home to Earth, we discussed the Vulcans, the Zindi, and the Preservers. In researching that video, we discovered that as wondrous as these encounters were, they're hardly a noteworthy day in Star Trek history. It seems as though Earth is something of a stopping point in galactic affairs, if one is to believe the number of aliens who've claimed residence on our little planet. There are the big-lobed visitors who pop in for an afternoon, and then there are those who set themselves up as part of the furniture. As the official date of First Contact is still April 5th, 2063, these encounters must fall into a sort of Section 31 black site somewhere. One can only hope that there isn't a version of ROM on ice buried in Area 51, even if some of the Ferengi Commerce Authority might prefer it that way. I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are 10 more alien encounters before First Contact. Number 10. The Trill. First contact with the Trill occurred much earlier than Federation records would have us believe, even if the precise event has yet to be seen on screen. Jadzia Dax changed the history books when she was accidentally thrown back in time along with Sisko and Bashir arriving in San Francisco in the early 21st century. This would have been contemporaneous to Talon's presence in LA, though San Francisco had its problems to contend with. For example, the Sanctuary Districts were powder kegs threatening to explode at any moment. With Sisko and Bashir trapped inside one of them, Dax was forced to work along alongside the locals to help them escape. She was lucky. As she wasn't injured badly enough to require a closer look, she was able to pass her trill markings away as a tattoo, therefore leaving the timeline unaltered. Sisko was not quite as fortunate, though leading to his face becoming immortalized in the history books, you know, for something other than starting the Dominion War. Number 9. Elorian. While it seems that the earliest official meeting between the Federation and Elorians took place during the Enterprise B's maiden voyage, there are several holes in that theory. First, the two transport ships that they are on are Federation in origin, so this suggests an earlier form of first contact. Second is in the form of Guinan, who, though present on the SS Lacoule, had also been present on Earth far earlier than this. When thrown into the 19th century, Lieutenant Commander Data encountered his shipmate, posing as a member of high society, fully aware of her Elorian status. This this is to say, the Guinan who appeared in San Francisco as a contemporary of Samuel Clemens knew who she was, what she was, and was in no rush to leave. As there have been, to the best of my knowledge, no historical headlines screaming, Elorians are invading! This suggests that they had, at one point, the technology to evade human detection. Guinan may have continued to utilize this technology when she moved as far as Los Angeles, establishing her bar, 10 Forward, wherein she encountered Jean-Luc Picard, again, over 100 years later. Number 8. Red Jack. Is there anything more terrifying than a deranged piglet holding a knife to one's throat? Full respect to John Fielding for his performance as Mr. Hengist in Wolf in the Fold, it was a challenge to make it work. Red Jack, an entity that thrived on fear, was finally destroyed in the 23rd century, but not before taking countless lives throughout the galaxy. The monster's path traced backward from the Enterprise to the Rigel colonies, but before that it had taken up residence on Earth. Red Jack was none other than Red Jack, or Jack the Ripper, a notorious serial killer who prowled London streets in the 19th century. He claimed five women's lives before vanishing, never to be identified by the authorities of the day. Its alien nature meant that he could hop from body to body, thereby allowing him to be almost anyone and escape at ease. It took the combined efforts of the Enterprise crew, as well as a healthy dose of drugs, to subdue the creature before it was finally beamed out into space, bringing its centuries-long reign of terror to an end. Number 7. Romulans. The Romulans aren't quite as prolific as their Vulcan cousins when it comes to human history, but they are by no means absent. Alternate histories and timelines see them delaying human developments, such as Agent Sarah in Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, but this is dedicated to Talon, the Romulan supervisor. Her assignment to protect and aid René Picard sees her hiding in plain sight, on Earth in the early 21st century. It takes another alien visitor to find her, more on that later, but when she and Jean-Luc Picard do meet, they quickly learn to trust one another. Having Talon played by Orla Brady certainly helped. The supervisors, for whom she works had previously intervened in human affairs, thanks Gary Seven, and are primarily tasked with ensuring history plays out the way that it should without interference. Talon, a Romulan, is something of a ray of hope as well. If Sarah represented the Romulans working to harm humanity, then surely the existence of Talon proves that there are still those who would wish to see it thrive. Number 6. Lanthanite 
That we know of, Pelia is the only on-screen Lanthanite we've ever seen. According to Spock, her people lived among humans for thousands of years before ever coming out, with their physiology being virtually identical to that of a human. Pelia boasted claims that she had lived on Earth around the time of Pythagoras, amassing a collection of historical artefacts that may or may not have fallen into her hands legally. In the 21st century, she was based in Vermont and was thankfully able to help a displaced La'an get where she needed to go. Lanthanites, possessing the lifespans that they do, were said to succumb to bouts of utter boredom. They quite literally were able to see and do everything when enough time had passed, so keeping things interesting was as important as breathing to them. This inspired Pelia to join Spock's sojourn, or, you know, stealing the Enterprise, subsequently joining the ship's crew just for something to do. Number five, Klingon. Though cutting it tight, this encounter between a human of the 21st century and a Klingon of the 24th does in fact occur before first contact. The fact that it's hours before first contact makes no difference. Lily Sloan encounters Lieutenant Commander Worf when she arrives on the bridge of the Enterprise E, having been seemingly rescued by Dr. Crusher, transported up from Earth's surface and promptly hunted by a cabal of Borg drones. It's been a weird day. Picard manages to calm the stranger in a strange land down, then brings her to what seems to be the safest place on the ship. Complete with its own honourable warrior, Worf, in trademark blunt honesty, announces to her that he has a Klingon. That's all, no further words or explanations are necessary. Barely a day earlier, the hunt for a sober pilot was Lily's biggest headache. Now she's orbiting her planet, with biomechanical Swedish zombies chasing her, while a gruff, rough-headed officer seems annoyed she doesn't know who or what he is. What a week. Number four, not cool. Thanks to the Temporal Cold War and the Temporal Wars in earnest, humanity came face to face with an alien race who closely resembled space vampires. The Nakul, cool, named only in production notes, were belligerents from the 29th century. They travelled back to Earth's 20th century in the hopes of winning the war in the past. Naturally, as often happens with malevolent aliens, they donned their best stormtrooper coats and sided with the Nazis. The casual brutality of the Nazis suited their ends. They resembled a group of Mengele's bent on using scientific research to advance their their goals, even if it meant devastation to those affected. Thankfully, they were stopped by the crew of the Enterprise, and history was set right again. This means that, technically, humanity both did and didn't encounter these folks before first contact. With that being the case, we'll leave them here, surrounded in the fog and intrigue that only those space vampires could achieve. Number three, Plutonians. The Plutonians were encountered by the crew of the Enterprise in the 23rd century. They were a then-modern-day reproduction of ancient Greece, having modelled their society on the teachings of Socrates and Plato. The group were natives of the planet Sandar, having been selected and bred via a form of advanced eugenics. Leaving their planet, they settled on Earth, studying the aforementioned philosophers, while the sun of their homeworld went supernova. When the ancient Greek civilization died out, they left Earth, travelling until they settled on the world that would later host Kirk and the landing party. Here, they encountered the drug Chironite. This substance granted them long life, telekinetic powers and telepathy. They became the very gods that had ruled over Greece, growing decadent and old. Much of their knowledge was lost. Having no need for medicine, their leader, Parman, was almost struck with a fatal wound on his leg. He was saved by Dr. McCoy, though the events of that away mission ended up having long-lasting effects on the Plutonians, the crew of the Enterprise and TV censors for years to come. Number 2. The Megans the Megans existed in their own private universe, capable of using what humans would refer to as magic, while also possessing the ability to change their appearance and form. Many millennia before the 23rd century, the Megans managed to travel between universes, eventually settling on Earth. They retained their abilities and set about guiding humanity in its growth and development. In an astounding and unique move in Earth's history, humanity quickly learned to abuse this advanced form of power, looking to co-opt it and corrupt it. By the 17th century, the remaining Megans settled in what became Salem. Here, they faced trials and accusations of witchcraft, demons, and other superstitious claims. Finally accepting that their dealings with humanity were at an end, the Megans elected to leave Earth and return to their own universe. The crew of the Enterprise encountered the survivors during the 23rd century, finally putting things right with them. They convinced the Megans, with the help of Lucian, that humanity had evolved, leaving those dark days behind. Number 1. Ferengi for conspiracy theorists and amateur paranormal historians, the events in Roswell, New Mexico, have provided decades of material to analyse, discuss and draw conclusions about. The prevailing thought is that big-eyed, long-fingered aliens crashed their flying saucer and that the US military covered it up. 
how very close to correct they actually were. Quark, Rom, and Nog, as well as a stowaway in the form of Odo, travel through time when their ship, Quark's treasure, becomes a time machine, thanks a bunch, Cousin Gala. The resulting events change human history forever and have brought hours of laughter to me since the episode Little Green Men aired in the 90s. From soldiers slapping the sides of their heads to Quark threatening invasion from marauder-type ships in orbit, the trip grows ever more ridiculous. The cover-up that takes place once the three Ferengi and one changeling fly into a nuclear blast even corresponds with the official reports of the day. It was all a weather balloon, okay? Nothing to see here. Hi, I'm Tom Larkin. Last time I told you about my GTN blog. Don't tell Starfleet. Thanks, Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform designed to help entrepreneurs stand out online. Squarespace allows me to link my social and multimedia accounts in just a few clicks. So you can see everything that GTN has to report, including things Starfleet doesn't want you to know. Squarespace uses Daystrom-approved design intelligence AI technology. Take control and build a beautiful, personalized website catered to your needs. SEO doodad, so you show up to more civilizations more often, but beware, Section 31 is a thing. Go to squarespace.com forward slash track culture, where you will get a free trial and 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain. And remember, don't tell Starfleet. And that's everything for our list today, folks. Thank you so much for watching along. You are awesome. You are cool. Frankly, you're just the best. Please make sure that you're following us on the various socials. I have been Sean Ferrick. You will catch me at Sean Ferrick. Make sure that you're following at Trek Culture as well. Until I see you again, make sure that you live long and prosper because you deserve it. Thanks very much, folks.